back to this is hardcore podcast you just heard statement of pride the track is called a fire inside if you haven't checked out episode 63 check it out carter holmes from within records payback off the tracks and now statement of pride for those who are um following along march 26 from within Records showcase at the first unitarian church this is a saturday matinee carter and the guys have so much shit going on from within records from within records podcast which i really hope that you guys check out and you know despite the fact that this is a florida-based record label there are a shit ton of bands from this area and it's great to see hardcore alive and well in so many people who are giving back carter being one of them multiple bands plays in bands that are not even from his state now he's got a new band straight out of pensacola florida they're fucking fantastic so make sure you support If you're not hip on the new Terror track, get with it. That shit is absolutely fucking hard. Can't help but hate. They even had Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse jump up on there in the track. And Terror, 20 years of being a band, releasing records. Sometimes the records uh, do not follow the blueprint of the first record. Sometimes I found in the last 20 years that depending on what age you were finding hardcore, really determined around a terror record. There's kids who, over the years, whatever the last terror record is, that's their favorite terror record, which I think is fantastic and emblematic of a band who basically has represented the scene in its finest for the last 20 years. So check that out. We got a lot of shit going on this weekend. Tonight, the fire you got Liberty Justice coming out here from Texas. If you listen to the Rule of Three podcast, we played a track on one of those episodes. Please Die, Mike Hooligan's band. They're playing early. Make sure to check that out. Probably by the time this will go to air, they'll be getting on stage. Um, Sunday, 2.30, East Downtown Fire Hall. Please Die, The Dusters. This is a uh, Spirit Flaw, Snub Nose, Soupy Band show. Check it out, East Downtown. Fire Hall, Monday, Drain, Pain of Truth, Ingrown, Chemical Fix, Combusted Church, Friday the show is being moved from the First Unitarian Church. Our friend Norm, who organizes all the shows for R5 and us, double booked. So we're going to have this show at the Yard. Karma Dare will be at the Yard with Raw Life. 
and choice to make. Make sure to check that the fuck out. Also, we have Strangle You Gum also coming to the yard. Lots of cool Philly hardcore shows in the coming weeks. Make sure to check it out. PhillyHCShows.com. Philly HC Shows on Instagram and Twitter. Philly Hardcore Shows on Facebook. Big shout out to Bob Wilson. Big shout out to AXBX, Chris X. Also, shout out to Soupy. Shout out to Zach Perone, Big Dennis, Cody Clark. A lot of what I learned in booking shows is that it takes more than one or two people. And although I appreciate when people say thanks to Joe for blah, 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 blah. So many people have given me a hand. And so many people deserve to also be thanked. So I want to make note of it here. I had initially gone in a different direction when I decided to talk about this topic. And I went another way after listening to it. I had a feeling that I didn't take... Not I, not that it would have been interesting or entertaining, but I got too in the weeds in some things and completely just, you know, didn't realize that I could have had a totally different angle, something probably more informative and potentially more interesting and less nuances in the details. So I hope you like it. Obviously, we made some Instagram reels telling you the episode was going to be delayed so this could work out. Came home, listened to it, didn't like Didn't like it. Couldn't amend it. Couldn't edit it, cut it out, chop it up. So I threw it out. And we're ready to rock. March 22nd, 1997. It was a Saturday night. And it was the first time that I promoted, booked, and organized my own hardcore show which is 11 years, uh, 11 days to the year um, away from being 25 years. And the small things accumulate in 25 years. The mistakes are paramount to the evolution of a process like this. I refuse to call it a career because... Not once in the 25 years did I say, I'm not going to take on a job and that I'm going to make these shows my living for a multitude of reasons. I didn't do that. And not all of it's highly ideal and, you know, morality based. Although I've never really wanted that at a certain point in the conversation, I'll get to more of why choosing to not be a professional And when I say professional, yeah, I mean, there's money that comes in. There's profits that are made. There's things that I have benefited from because I've made money on shows. But for the times where I won, there's plenty of times where I lost. And it's been a wild and amazing ride. And I often get asked from younger promoters, from people like to start, you know, the simple things. Like, how do you guys get started? But it's, it's a different world. Or, you know, like, what advice would you give someone who wants to start out? And, and and the bizarre thing is, is the world is different today in 2022 than it was in 1997. And yet, some of the basics are skipped over in today's booking, promoting world for the hardcore punk scene. And I wish that some people would go back to the very basics. Get some prerequisites in. Get their reps up. And... This episode was looming on me as far as solo topical conversations that I could have with you without a a guest or an interview. And when I first approached this was more from the nuanced angle. And I have a wider lens I think I'm going to approach this topic with today. So... Who, where, and why, or how come into play here. And in fact, the show itself, for all intents and purposes, is a blip in the radar of the hardcore scene in Philadelphia. Unless you were involved with what we already had going on, which is a huge ingredient to how 
this first show and many shows after in our neighborhoods would come together. But it wasn't like it is today where I'm putting on a show and multi-generations of hardcore people from Philadelphia and outside of the city are coming and bands are traveling from super far. None of that was the case. And really a lot of what would come out of me doing shows wasn't my doing. You know, at the time, we're talking about my first show, I was 16, turning 17. So I wasn't really responsible for much of anything in the Philadelphia hardcore scene. But yet at the same time, I was starting to brew some things, and this was the culmination of that. So we're going to backtrack for a bit. Um, Sorry for people who listen to other podcasts that I've been on or those who are avid listeners of this epi- of this podcast or our Rule of Three podcast because some of the stuff that I talked about will come up again. And it's also to service people who may not have heard these things or just are casual listeners. In 1995, I started a band with my friend Ron. My friend Ron's now in a, a sick death metal band called Blasphemous. And it was just for fun, you know? I was 14 turning 15. He, I think he was 18 turning 19 or something like that. And we started this band. And we were fucking god awful. But most things that you start with, it, I do believe if you're earnestly just doing it for fun, if you're, if you're sensitive or you're wise to the things around you, there still is good lessons and there's things that can come from you younger people starting these new bands. You know, your first band... It's just like the first time you hit a baseball out in a in a game as a kid. No one's expecting you to hit the fucking home run. You might not even get on fucking base, and it's okay to strike out. It, it's more important to get out there and take your fucking swing. And so this band lasted, I think, all of seven, eight months. But in that time period, we all were collectively starting to shed some of this, like, uh, if you, depending on how you viewed it. You know, if we were people from not the Philadelphia hardcore scene. We were people from the neighborhoods, the real city of Philadelphia. And collectively, our area had a surge of interest between punk, hardcore, metal, and we had become like this insane conglomerate. Because if you broke it down at a macro level, which I spoke a lot on in the version I decided to go away from from the Bridge and Pratt L station which is now like I think they call it like Frankfurt you know transportation terminal it's the first L train station that takes you all the way through the entire rest of the city out to the suburbs into well I'm gonna call it suburbs anymore just into Upper Darby and Delco we're the first stop and all these bus lines would hit that stop so just right there there's all these people that we were interacting with as we all started finding these shows in these different clubs in, you know, downtown. There was a couple of places like the cell block, which was just outside of Philadelphia. You could take the bus to, but it was this cross contamination of either people finding out music. Cause you gotta remember the early nineties had the benefit of headbangers ball. It had the beginning of the benefits of 120 minutes, but it was still a lot of underground shit and you had to go down and find it. South Street, however, in Philadelphia was like a huge fertile ground for people in Philadelphia who just took the time to go down there. As they say, South Street, South Street, where all the hippies meet. None of us were fucking hippies. <laughs> in fact, I think a lot of us were the opposite. Although bizarre enough, we still would go down to South Street and buy hacky sacks because as per the time, that was the sport of the non-jocks like ourselves. You know, um, I was an avid collector of heavy metal magazines, rock magazines, uh, uh, cassette tapes, and I got an earlier start than a lot of people. So all the people that I kind of started fucking with were already in high school, you know, so I'm like in sixth, seventh grade, but all my friends are in, you know, some of them are freshmen, but then, you know, the deal from going off high school, you didn't just roll with freshmen. So, you know. I was 12 and 13 years old, but I was hanging out with dudes that were 14 to 17. 
And so in our own little home group, we had varying degrees of people who fucked with different stuff. You know, collectively, we were all metalheads. I think that's all we viewed it. But being aware of punk rock was a thing. But no one was hard, dyed in the paint, 77s, mohawk shit. No one was a skinhead and um, anything like that. But that would eventually be something that would come from other people in our neighborhood. As I started breaking away from that initial core group, you would see a lot more than that. But what would happen is as the na- our neighborhoods were getting worse and worse, my mom and a couple of the other moms were like, we don't care if you go downtown. We don't care if you go to these shows. Just stay the fuck out of the neighborhood because it was getting crazy. You know, you got to remember 1990, uh, 80s in Philly at the crack and the 90s, it was even getting crazier with the guns. You know, I'm not going to blame the hip hop music, but you take your average uh, hood movie from the early 90s and it's a lot of kids on the corner shooting each other over drugs. Ironically, 30 years later, that's exactly what Philadelphia is now. But, you know, us being white long hairs in a mixed neighborhood was not good for us. So our parents collectively didn't give a fuck what we did as long as we didn't do it in the neighborhood. Because in the neighborhood, all it was was sitting in a cemetery and throwing rocks at cop cars, drinking 40s and cough syrup. And smashing shit and fucking cutting people's phone lines and stealing the telephones out of the Bridge and Pratt L station and fire stealing fire extinguishers from the septic buses and just causing mayhem because we weren't engaged, you know. We were, yeah, you know, we played some flag football, played some tackle football in the cemetery. We played Dungeon and Dragons shit, but it just wasn't enough. Puberty had set in, and you know there was a couple girls, but you know it, it wasn't it wasn't like it is. So. We got lucky in that our parents supported us not being around in the neighborhood. And that really is what pushed us to go beyond. And without that kind of support, I don't think any of this shit would have happened. So props to the moms and the pops who let us out of there. Now, little by little, everything kind of centered out. Boom, 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 like a big circle. Started with, you know, checking out some metal shows that weren't just the big spectrum stuff. We, you know, we were on South Street. So obviously right there in front of us at the TLA, right there in front of us with J.C. Dobbs, the record stores, the flyers, you know, all that stuff was right in our face. But it would take a combination of going to, you know, different different venues. You know, there was some decent shows at the Trocadero. There were some decent shows at the TLA. And, um... I, for me, I didn't want to stay in just metal. I was excited about all the shit, you know. Um, we would eventually meet up with people like my boy Ron Dog, and his girl was into like she was a big, big John Goth girl. So next, you know, we're hanging out in Goth clubs, and you know, so it's a bunch of us hanging out in Goth clubs on a Sunday night. Uh, we're still going to shows, and little by little, the the neighborhood people who didn't mind like. You know, Philly neighborhoods are what they are. We've talked about it many times, so I'm not going to go too much in detail, but some people just want to stick around their block. So our crew started falling off little by little, but the new crew started popping up. You know, I mean, I met Straight Edge Chris at a mad young age. I, I met a lot of people in the neighborhood around this stuff, and everybody was still slowly starting to shed some of their stuff as they found more hardcore. Hardcore was kind of funny. The, like the more percentage that you were hardcore, the less you were other things. And we weren't pushing away. We weren't hiding being metal. But it was this new thing, and it was growing, especially in our neighborhood. And there was mad bands happening. None of these bands were really like a hardcore band, but there was bands playing these little church halls, and they were playing the VFW, or they were playing the YMCA. And, you know, for the few people in the entire neighborhoods, it was something to go that was like what we were into, even if the bands were ass. But in a lot of these bands that would come up would in the second or third iteration of their bands would be something more punk, would be something more hardcore. And eventually we would get to the point where there was intoxicated from Junietta. There was public urination from Junietta, but they also had Delaware County members. There was U.S. Expulsion, which is another Junietta band. Um, some dudes from my neighborhood, Morgatory, were like old death metal Nazi dudes who all cut their hair and started trying to play heavier and less death metal. Uh, we ran into Buddy Cram and the guys, Dave, Brian Clark, RIP, Dave Clark. And, um, they were doing this band Kensington. We saw them in Frankfurt playing a show with these, like, 
I bet now if they if we ever had recordings, I bet the kids who jerk off to Third and Bly and all this nineties grunge shit would have loved this shit. But there was a bunch of local kids who went from being total fucking squares to uh being like the first kids that wanted to be Nirvana and Pearl Jam in our neighborhood. And their bands would play at this church. So we would go there and uh check out stuff, look for girls, that kind of deal. And that's how we ran into Kensington. And little by little there was more of that going and we ran into um a guy from the neighborhood who had a real cool band at the time called The Broken, and uh, his name was Vex. That guy like really took me on the way and told everybody I was his little cousin, my little bris brother, and he he did a lot for getting us when we started doing the band. Like he would sit there at practice and yell at us because we were so fucking bad, and um, he put us on our first show, and it was through him because his band was older. All them dudes were not even in high school; they were like. You know, they're like men compared to us. Uh, them and their friends, ACID, those guys were like, you know, fucking 18, 19 when some of us are 14 and 15. They had small bands and small shows also in the northeast of Philadelphia. Asset was like a goth thing, so we'd always see them at the goth nights and all. All this conglomeration of different shit where it wasn't like, I fucking love hardcore, nothing else. We weren't quite there yet. You know, um, but it was through this band that we would eventually play at a place called the Ferenz. And although I was involved in making flyers and we would help, you know, be like, oh, let's do a show. I never said this is my show because it was always kind of everybody all together. You know, the older guys, Mark Fisher, who was an intoxicated, you know, he would do his own shows at the parks, like we, uh, Piccoli uh, Playground at the Hooker Park. And, um, even at the Bay Junietta Park, he would have shows. His father was a roofer, so he had generators, so that everything would run off generators. A lot of fun neighborhood bands would play there. It's really a scene that had a flash in a pan moment. But without that, there wouldn't have been anything about Blacklisted. There never would have been a uh, Victory Strike, which never would have lent the horror show and letter to the band. Nothing. Never would have been a punishment. So all this stuff that doesn't really have anything to do with Hardcore kids, you can't go find it on the internet. It all is like this primordial soup that'll eventually elevate us all into what we have now. And the Foren shows was the easiest way to have all of our bands play together. And mind you, this is just our area. So you had Morrell Park and you had Bristol people like Mike Mig from, you know, at the time he was in Scar for Life. Obviously, they'd only be in punishment. You had our friend, RIP, Jason and Sana. And Luke, who had Life Sick Life, they were Morel Park dudes. Max and um, all the boys, they had this uh, Philly Boot Boys thing, which turned into 2404. Uh, and later, Max would start a band with Jarrett Weiner. Then he would be in bands like Heinick. And his last band, Eatin' Alive, was pretty cool. Obviously, Max passed away. It's crazy how many times I'm going to say RIP in this. But in general, these were a lot of our friends' first bands. But it wasn't just our neighborhood in for Philadelphia. There was the Northeast, there was the, you know, all over there was people finding this shit. So as it breaks down, you know, I've said this before, my mom was involved in like working clubs, working rock clubs, started like, bringing bands to shows. And she also was fucking wild and hanging out at after hour places. And in the neighborhood, there was this place called the Three C's that was like not a great hall run by the last Italians in the neighborhood before they even left. And she got us this room because I was like, I want to do shows. I want to do shows. I want to do shows. I, I wanted to get just beyond the forens because kind of reverse of what happened. We had so many people who lived in our neighborhoods who were too young and their parents didn't want them going downtown. We wanted to have something that wasn't at a park or a Quinn, the bar where there really wasn't. You had to sneak in to get in because it was, you know, there was a bar, even though only Joe McHenry didn't get into the show. Fucking did that the Nebula campaign fucking uh, Wretched One show. Only Joe McHenry didn't get in. <laughs> Fuck him. <laughs> so he still fucking hates it 20 something years later. But I wanted to haul because there were so many cool neighborhood shows and I wanted to do something purely hardcore because there was other shows like there was the Sofa Records thing. There was a couple churches. This band Step Ahead, which would eventually Dave House would go on to be pretty popular. In other state, Dave had Step Ahead. There was a couple bands doing things. There was this uh, Christian thing with Sofa Records, Pink Daffodils, and One Two One, and those things kind of crossed over. So there was those kind of small shows in the neighborhood, but it wasn't like never felt really hardcore to us, and we didn't have our bands on it. So the culmination of this very first show that I did on um, 
was at Unity Street, which we called U- Unity Street Hall, which is a three C's if you're a neighborhood person. And it's the first time on the flyer it says Joe Hardcore Presents. And the show was Step Ahead. Obviously, Dave House would go on to be pretty popular elsewhere. Uh, Life Sick Life. I mean, yo, they had a real CD at the time, which is fucking phenomenal because of how hard that was. Um, and there was like real hardcore bands that didn't have CDs yet. <laughs> so that was a big deal. Um, I don't even know if Proceed Play, but Walt had done this crazy show at Beaver College, which is now called Arcadia, with like Fury of Five and E Town Concrete, H2O, Bound, which eventually Jay would go on the sing for Kid Dynamite, and all the other bands. Uh, they had that band. They were tight with Step Ahead. So, um, Step Ahead, Life Sick Life, Proceed. Uh, our boys from Jersey, The Real Deal, Burnside, we met them. Through the forens, we would see them at shows. Like we saw them at the Twenty Five to Life, Hatebreed, Ubisoft, All Else Failed show, or not All Else Failed, No One's Hero show, and um, that like in the beginning you just kind of hard look people and not say what's up, but then you start seeing them at all the shows. So we became cool with all the guys on the other side of the bridge a couple years back, and then we would go to some of their shows. But the Ego Cage Boys lived out in Browns Mills, New Jersey, which is in the middle of nowhere. Danny and Jimmy Brown are fucking awesome, still my bros to this day. And we brought Ego Cage the first time they ever played Philly. <laughs> and they're like white trash. They used to play on stage with 40s in their hands. They were our homies. They came through. Obviously Intoxicated, which is like the centerpiece of the neighborhood. If um if you fucked with Intoxicated, you were probably from Junietta, Fishtown, Kensington, Frankfurt. But the Junietta had, you know, you either were wearing like an army jacket, drank a beer, looked like a skinhead, or you were like a 77 punk dude. You're just some like neighborhood. Like for those who understand like English culture like like more like chav looking dudes that's how a lot of our neighborhood dudes like the polo hat you know not sporty soccer sneakers and that's how a lot of us still dress it's kind of like you know it's kind of bizarre that lower lower class (laughs) working class neighborhoods kind of dress the same and that's how we kind of dress then but um the entire uh Junietta Brew crew all them guys came out for intoxicated obviously can't do that show without Kensington and then I was even then I was thinking about like bringing people in and together and so the people who were doing them grunge bands they started turning a leaf because corn was already played and there was all this other stuff happening which I'll get to in a bit where this kind of like started pushing people towards a hardcore kind of sound so this band meltdown it was one of their first shows from when they were doing this grunge thing and those guys played ultimately my first show was a drop in a bucket but It's a bucket. It's going to collect over time. And from that, so many things happened. Uh, My buddy Kit, his mom had a computer and the internet. So I put my my name up like, hey, for promoters, for contacts. Uh, God bless you if you called my mother back then looking for me. Um, It's funny, on this flyer, I put my my cell phone number, or my cell phone number, my house number. Carmen and I, RIP to Carmen, my roommate, this was the show I did actually ended up being the last time we lived together because the show the after show was at my apartment and that was a total chaos move. So I moved back to my mom's house. And um for years my mom was my unpaid secretary. People from all over call and have like an hour of conversation trying to get a hold of me to book a show in Philadelphia. And I started telling people like, Hey, I do shows in Philly, hey I do shows. I wrote I wrote a lot of fucking letters. I wrote a lot of letters to people. Just you know, like how you would send an email to people hoping they write back? Well, I was sending fucking letters in the mail. Hi, I am Joe Hardcore. I would like to have you play in Philadelphia. And hopefully they write a letter back or call. And, uh, you know, that's how I got started. That's how this whole thing began. But locally, giving these kind of shows a thing really helped grow our our friendships started growing that network and there was a bunch of shows that would happen at unity um dysphoria uh what's that band from pa um i'll remember this fucking there's was, there was a lot of shows the first bad luck 13 show was bad luck 13 that snail trail happened there and a lot of our friends band play the biggest show with two biggest shows i think we did there or two of the biggest shows that i remember was when come and correct the mushmouth came and there was a giant fight with all these girls on the block party down the street from the venue, and it was out of control, but it didn't affect the show up. But the whole show stopped, 
and went outside to watch like a 20 on 20 fight at the corner store. And then later on, like the big, I think the biggest show we did do was at Unity Street Hall was the 25 to Life show, which all of our friends played. But also, Anthony Rice, uh, Anthony Race from Long Island would come down with Overthrow and this band called Reason to Believe. And, you know, I think even Relentless was on that bill, but it was a ton of bands. 25 to Life played a huge day. And it was actually when, like, people started in Philly started acknowledging, like, oh, 25 to Life is like a thing. So I got kind of lucky because. We would do these shows in the neighborhoods and not a lot of people would come out. And so it is the show where people are like, damn, how the fuck is the shows out here? Like to them, this is the middle of nowhere, but even though it's a fucking inner city and it's like popping in the hood, it's right off the, you know, it's a trap block. And that was like fucking awesome. You know, it was like right when Strength Through Unity came out and here I am, I'm fucking 17 years old and boom, here we go. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the fuck? This is it. Um. Yeah, it, it was fantastic. The hall gave us some cool shit, and then they stopped. But um, what ended up happening from that, obviously, is history. The things that I would learn from doing these shows, I would put into principle at other places. We had some wild shows with Bad Luck 13. If you go on the internet, the FSV Judge Club got smashed up. Did that show with Unity, um, the Junietta Hall, American Legion Hall, Bad Luck 13 with the first time Death Threat came down here, All Out War. Cooper from Clubber Lang, single with Clubber Lang, Jarrett and Max's band's first show. It was fucking awesome. Oh, Berry Ground, Burial Ground. That was the band that came down. I was thinking about it in my head. It got stuck. You know, we got, we were friends with a lot of bands. A lot of bands from New York came down. We always fucked with the New York bands. Hard to get some Baltimore bands to come up. Had a lot of bands like Cypher and shit come through. And it was all a process, you know. And I should make mention, by the time that I did this show, I wasn't playing in bands anymore. And I started becoming like the dysphoria roadie, which is a whole nother thing that gave so many more things a possibility to happen because I started linking up and networking more and more every time I would go out on these weekend shows with dysphoria, which in itself is a weird thing because I was focused on booking shows and just traveling and meeting people. But by proxy of being out on the road with dysphoria was the first time I was like, I got the bug again because I wasn't a great bass player. I wasn't focused. Obviously, ADHD. I, I was about to be a dad before I was even 17 years old. And, you know, I, I, I just didn't feel it. So I wanted to be a promoter. And I wanted to do go on tour. And then through being a promoter who met people and went on tour and would talk to people and try to help their bands come down and play Philadelphia area, I ended up wanting to do a band again. And that band was Punishment which obviously we did our 22 years since our first show thing. And that was the vehicle to funnel all of this stuff. Through punishment tours, I would meet so many people. Through punishment tours, I would learn so much. I met so many amazing fucking promoters, booking agents. So many people who are in bands would eventually be booking agents or be managers or be all of these things. And it was like, you know, if if anything... The shows that I'm talking about in the, when I should have been in high school were my high school. And it was punishment that became my college education in hardcore. And I would learn a lot of the ups and downs. I would learn a lot of things through my own mistakes. We weren't perfect. In fact, we were the fucking failing student who just, I don't know, just didn't get kicked out of school. You know, we kicked ourselves out of school. But it was in this education that a lot of the things that I still take on in the 25 years now doing shows, this education has been put to work. And that's why when I think about doing shows for so long, had I not traveled, had I not toured later punishment, I would hang that up to tour more seriously with Shattered Realm and then go to Europe and add a different elevation, you know, like like a postgraduate of like, okay, well, here's what happens when a band has like a big label behind there's some buzz and you're, you know, internationally able to travel. That was another bit of education that would only lend back to how I am as a promoter. And it was in touring with Shattered Realm and the the falling out of Posse Numbers, the end of Hellfest, and with the serendipitous nature of the scene in Philadelphia and Sean Agnew starting to, you know, teach me how to do shows and show me some of the things that he does 
that all was like a perfect storm to bring out the very first This Is Hardcore Fest. But if you if you zoom out a bit, the very first Hardcore Fest happened in July, or actually August of 2006, whereas that's almost nine years after my very first show. Now, I'm not going to say I was operating at full capacity from, say, 07 to 01, maybe around 07 to 01, in between tours, we were having shows. If I couldn't get a hall to do my own show, I was able to link with people to help my friends' bands play. And Because of punishment, we would play and I would promote it as my own show. And it was through Club HP, which showed up in the far part of the Northeast, in the end of, oh, it might have been end of 99. No, no, it was, yeah, the end of 0001. And that's when really I had a club that I could book regularly at and bring more bands. And we did a lot of awesome shows there from 01 to 04. But bizarrely enough, again, as things got better in Philadelphia, punk wise, hardcore wise, because of Sean Agnew, because of the way the scene started flourishing, it wasn't as viable. To have shows in the neighborhood. People saw like, oh, that's out there. Like, why would we do shows out there when there's house shows in, you know, University City around these colleges and Temple? Well, fuck you, that's what we got. So, you know, it, it it was an interesting transformation to take wanting to do a show in the neighborhood where I wanted to get people from the neighborhood their shows to being kind of hamstrung by only having shows in the neighborhood and having to go back and start working on being able to do shows in the center of city. And it's only through, and I say this all the time, it's only through the mentorship and tutelage of Sean Agnew and R5 Productions that I was ever able to get to that thing. And it's been 17 years of doing shows at the First Unitarian Church. And then later, you know, after This Is Hardcore, there's more and more that would come. And, and it's, it's an evolution process. You know, there's a lot learned. And a lot of this for me as a promoter is what I want to do. Because I'm not a promoter that is like, I want to pay my rent booking shows. Because the minute you start thinking like that, you're not going to be able to always do the things that are benevolent for everybody because you have to think of, like, I have tons of people who said to me, well, I got to think about my bottom line here. My bottom line is the continuity and the perseverance of Philly hardcore in its own right. Not just as bands, but our scene of people not just going to rock concerts where, you know, AF and Sick of It All and the bands that play those kind of shows from time to time behind the barriers. There's a lot of fucking scenes that promoters gave up. And, and unless an agent puts it in a big room owned by a corporate company, it's the only way these fucking cities have shows sometimes. I don't want that. You know, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of venues, there's a lot of different people, there's a lot of shows that are 21 plus and all this bullshit. And a younger me now would have been like chiding that, like, this is stupid, why are they doing this? And, you know, I still think some of the stuff is stupid and I have my own personal politics and aesthetics and, you know, beliefs on what a, what a punk rock and a hardcore show should be. But I'm just happy that the area is so fucking fertile that there's so many different ways to skin this cat. And there are so many ways that shows are flourishing. People are building new bands. And there's all these goofy-ass micro-scenes. So, hey, if you don't like us, go fuck yourself. Hang out with your friends in your basement shows and be the king of the basement. I don't care. It's great. But what I'm not going to do is make a choice to not do some shows because they're not profitable. And I'm not going to put profit over making sure we're doing the right things by the bands. And in that, I feel successful. In that, I feel vindicated. Um, in 1997, I was working for $60 a day cash, getting up with the sun, coming home on the end of a pickup truck, with a group of Irish people and we were doing stucco and I was the laborer. Hard work has never escaped me. From time to time, I would work in cabinet shops. Later, I would work in residential concrete, residential laboring, and I would 
once the touring process would happen, preferably obviously cabinet making and working in a, in a shop was easier, though working with my father and my uncle, fucking chaos. This is like one and two man jobs, one and two man, very small businesses, not a lot of money on the table, a lot of mistakes could cost money, but that was my tutelage in woodworking. And eventually I would work other places. I couldn't work with my dad or my uncle. And, but I would have to go on tour and tour came first. And I would walk up and say, Hey, yo, in two weeks, I'm not here no more for a bit. You want me to come back? I'll come back. Done that dozens of times from the time I was 21 to 27 or actually 26. I was turning 26. A friend of mine was like, I can change your life and get you the most money you ever had. I'm like, dude, I'm not involved in anything illegally. So no, 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 I'm going to get you in union concrete. So from that point forward, that point forward, I've had a stable career minus worried about going to jail and stressing out when I was on house arrest. But for the last 15 years, I've had a union job and I've had benefits and I've had a pension. And so even more so, you know, it does suck when you lose $2,000 on a show because of bad weather. And luckily, almost every time I've lost a lot of money on a show, it's because of bad weather, not by bad choices or bad decisions. Though I have lost money on some misunderstanding or, you know, yeah, 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 we're going to kill it and it not work out. Which, again, over time, in 25 years, you learn, I learn systems to put in place and I learn ways to kind of judge things better instead of just going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, I try to explain at the gate for younger promoters to learn the math. Don't just, yeah, 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 take the time, learn the very basics, you know, um, you wouldn't go ahead and listen to something that is super technical metal if you're trying to learn how to play the guitar, start at basics and work your way up, it's the same thing for promoting, and it was through Sean Agnew and the guys who were really doing it well that really broke me down and put me on to no longer doing piece of paper and a pen uh, but doing it all on Excel sheets. I had to teach myself Excel and, you know, just so I could get a better, quicker ability to throw offers. There's a lot of stuff that I was, I still abscond from time to time. I don't really, not out of choice. Sometimes I forget to sign contracts because it's like I have a good relationship, but it's only because I've been doing it for 25 years and I have these kind of relationships that sometimes I fucking forget to do the e-signature on the email for a contract. But as a general rule and principle, I managed to keep a lot of my DIY ethics. I, I'm 100% DIY in my tactics. I, I've never sat there on my hardest day. And I've fallen into concrete from exhaustion. They call it falling out. I've had concrete, cur- concrete burns on the back of my neck and my shoulder, the back of my calf. I've been taken out of an oil tank because it was 100 inside or 100 outside, 110 inside. And I dehydrated to the point through pouring for eight hours that I my legs cramped up and I couldn't move my leg. No point that I say, I'm going to get a fucking office job. Because I always saw the, the desk and the playing the corporate way as losing the ability to be flexible. And man props to the motherfuckers. Yo, Kevin Horn, that's my man. Um, Brian, Brian Dilworth, who passed away, RIP, who's like the mentor that got us into the electric factory. And a lot of the guys like Tim War, who's been on the show, a lot of the OG motherfuckers who've been around over 30 years, they started with a pen and a piece, pen and a piece of paper, or, uh, you know, they started on telephones, not emails, and they grew their skills, not through corporate tutelage and following pol- company policy but just edging out and doing their own thing and forging their own way. And by being a force in the DIY scenes and by being a tour de force and business person and doing the the right business, that they became an equitable thing that the bigger universe wanted to bring in to the point where both these guys would start their own businesses and operate as their own entities. I think that's an amazing thing, but I don't have that bug to go ahead and be my own boss and just book bands and just do shows because what happens when, I mean, I'm 41, I'll be 42 in just about four months. What happens when I'm 60, you know, unless I'm making bizarre amounts of money, which don't come from booking hardcore shows, even from booking the average hardcore band, the money's not there. So 
uh, against the um, will of the Bronx tell Sonny. I, I do. I don't believe the working man's a sucker. I believe the working man is a right way to do things. And through my union employment and having the versatility of being able to pick what jobs I'm on or pick where companies have what work, I still have freedom, but I have a good pay and it makes doing the shows I want to do possible. It's not make or break if these giant entities like Live Nation and AAG come into the market, which used to be called the city, but now all cities are markets, and they would just take a bigger piece of the pie. I've watched that happen. And if I was a smaller promoter who was independent, it would have been in my best interest to try to find a job at a corporate level. But because it's just me, Bob does shows, Alex, we're teaching our shows. Krista's shows were just our own little small thing. It's not a like a formal, you know, business. It's just kind of like a piecemeal thing, collective, so to speak, that I'm able to exist. And I, I get into this so you understand that where I come from in modern day and how I've approached things. Because being a being a promoter for 25 years, I, I, there's people who have been doing shows for many years at that corporate level. But a lot of what happens at the corporate level is you're on a conveyor belt, like a factory. And in lieu of sometimes, yeah, there's dudes that definitely make their own moves and much, much love to the people that can live in a corporate structure, but still make their own moves. But a lot of it comes down to the conveyor belt system. So I don't even put them in the same fucking boat. I don't even put them in the same level with some of the OG hardcore promoters that did everything off the top of their head. And, I thank everybody for the respect given to This Is Hardcore and the time that I've put into booking shows that I'm still able to come to the table and work with these bands that are successful and it's that way. But through through the things I'm going to talk about next, you got to understand, Hardcore is still like the primordial soup in the music world. And as we talked about last week with the turnstile, you know, I had, I had forgotten the name and miss and misspoke, so I took it out. But you know, H two O was on uh, Conan O'Brien when Conan O'Brien was one of the biggest things. H two O is not a worldwide, commercially millions and millions of dollars band because of it. You know, they're just a band that has never stopped since they started in the early nineties. And, and you know, for the most part, they have growth where there's times when they're selling a thousand person rooms out, and there's times we're playing in front of five hundred persons rooms. It's the ebb and flow of these bands and their careers that I've watched happen in the 25 years. And because of my name staying what it is and me doing my best for the bands and me working for the kids so the shows are awesome. And, you know, in 25 years, I think I've booked in over 30 fucking or more clubs because clubs open, clubs close, you know. And depending on what time you found hardcore, it depends on where the shows were at in the city because the city has not had one club open now with the end of the Trocadero through this entire time period that I'm talking about in 25 years. We're constantly moving shit to a new club. We're constantly, oh shit, this is going to close or this place is shutting down, we have to go here. So during the pandemic, it didn't really fucking change things too much for me. And it's always that ability to be mobile and to change tactics and to be able to shift and move that allowed us to stay operative and i know people who did shows were like oh well once this club clock closed just kind of stopped and yo again bob wilson out there getting it fucking scouring the earth like fucking sherlock holmes for for clues to find different venues it's a fucking man you know r5 has always gotten in the rooms and i don't know why but sean loves me i guess and we get lucky that we also get to book in some of these rooms because of what the r5 dudes do and r5 is still at a different level than what we are at and and it's because of his hard work and because of what those guys do that the indie scene, the indie rock scene and all the different indie stuff. And even those guys do hardcore shows from time to time. They still do them very well. But it, it, it's in the flexibility that I think that really kept me going for 25 years. And I also see that the way to do things from my perspective, you know, um, it has to work for what goes on the rest of my life again, which is, you know, <laughs> I was at, I rushed home to make sure this podcast sounded right. 
had second guesses, so I put it on the track, a secret track, so I could listen to it. And was like, fuck, this is dumb. I don't like this. And all night I'm at Converge thinking, fuck, I got to change this podcast. By the time I got home, it was sleep for 32 minutes and do the podcast or go to work and fix it. So that's what I had to do. But um, if I was going to get into some how-tos real quick, and I'd rather like to take some Q&A for those listening, and I'd rather break down than get too deep into it. But if you're going to do a show, it's your first show, start small. Don't chase after your favorite band. Chase after your friend's band. Without Kensington, without Ego Cage, without Intoxicated, without Lysic Life, I never would have had a first show. And obviously, the the thing that I see happening sometimes is the young kid promoter does exactly what I would say. They would be like, well, our band doesn't play, so I'm going to book my own show. Also, there needs to be said in this modern element Maybe your band isn't getting a fucking show because you're not going to these motherfucking shows. You know, you can't be some why me, bitch. How come I'm not on the show when you're not at the show? You know, it's a different time period where the internet makes everybody feel like they're ubiquitous and everybody should know everything about what everyone has going on. But in all these different goofy microcosms, house shows and small shows and bar shows and plane shows and underwater shows... These motherfuckers don't come to the regular show, so sometimes people don't know who the fuck you are, and they don't follow you on the internet. So the reason why your band isn't playing in your own fucking city is because you're in some side mission, underground, 25-person hardcore scene mad that no one's booking you. But I know for a fact, because me and Bob have stood by this for fucking many years, if you are a kid who comes to our shows and you have a band... I don't even care if you're good. I'm going to try to put you on a show and maybe it'll get better. Because my first band sucks. Punishment, we were never great, but we had something. And it was the energy to go out and tour and do the thing. And over time, people liked it. So I get it. I'm not looking for the home run fucking band out of locals. But I need to say this. If your local kid goes, well, I don't get booked. What the fuck do you do to put your name out? Do you have a flyer? Do you, do you tell the people doing shows? You know how many times you're like, hey, can you book my band? Yeah, hit me up. Never hit me up. How many times has someone handed me a flyer to show that they're fucking playing? Never. I'm supposed to just be all-knowing. I ain't no fucking all-knowing, all I see and motherfucker. It's not how it works. You want to be part of your hardcore scene. If I was living in Philadelphia and I was a young kid, Soupy's age, I always pick on Soupy now, <laughs> um, I wouldn't be like, fuck Joe Hardcore, I'm going to do my own shit. Like, Joe, what do I got to do, man? And that's what that motherfucker did. Now you see the soup out there. He's loading gear. He's, push, he's pushing his own flyers. He's coming from dinner with dressed up nice and looking like a nice little skinhead. He's handing out the flyers. He's being a part of the fucking mechanism. Because who the fuck knows? I'm fucking 41 years old. In 10 years, Bob's going to be almost fucking... Holy fuck, Bob might also be almost 52. How crazy is that? <laughs> In fucking 10 years, we might be like, hey, soup, this is all yours. You know, join the fucking mission. Join the system. And help out your local shit before you're like, I gotta do my own thing because no one knows us. Join your thing before you start that, is what I'm gonna say. And start with your friends. Book your friends' bands. Cap your own people up before you go chasing out some band. Like, hey, I'm gonna email the guy from Vane and ask him if I can he could play my very first show. That's not gonna work. You gotta build that shit up. You gotta have a resume. You know? <laughs> not like a LinkedIn profile, but like Certain bands at certain elements have agents, they have management, they have different things in place, and they're not going to be like, oh yeah, some random kid in a city where we already have connections. Now, if you live in out of your bip or western out of your bip, you have a better chance of booking some band like that because they may want to just play if they think there's a good show. But if you're doing something from an established area or a congested area with multiple kind of shows, fall the fuck back unless no one's booking the kind of show that you fuck with, you know, like if you're in a, it's more, this is more of a nineties and early 2000 thing. Like if everyone's posy, but you guys are heavy. Yeah. Then you got to book your own shit. But I found now a lot of the hardcore scenes are pretty homogenized and everything's kind of like, you know, people like what's now more than they have like divided total scenes, unless it gets down to like the people that wear the leather jackets all the time with the patches and that kind of stuff. Cause that's more subcultural than in the hardcore world, so to speak. So, number one, I would say make sure that if you're going to start shows, start with your friend's shows. Work small. Learn some math. And then ask questions. Hit people like me up. Hey, how do you do this? Look at, you know, what do we do this? And if there's someone in your area who's done it before, see if they'll take you one as a mentor. Show you some shit. 
You know, it's not too hard to ask. What's the worst going to say? Nah, you know what? I'm not really feeling that. I know they have these internships with those different corporate entities. I'm sure there's people that intern and they start that way. And there's different ways to do that. You know, you can just work at the venue and stuff. I mean, there's avenues to get in there. But I do think that having some base experience is always good as far as try something. Try it at the smallest level and then try to improve on it. I mean... Another thing I always hear people ask is like, well, how do you get people to want to play your shows and it's time? It's building off of something small. That drop in the bucket that started March 22nd, 1997, you know, um, that was just my own bucket. There was already a bucket with some water in it. And I just wanted to start my own little thing, not to be Joe Hardcore Presents, but because I wanted to do more. I saw a lot of my friends who... You know, as I'm talking about this, you know, the guys who were going to shows in 1994 to 1997, they were done going to shows by 1998. You know, it was even evident as a young kid, you know, seeing shows, seeing all the people that I grew up with getting excited about going to shows and within two, three years being done with it. And and from traveling from dysphoria and, you know, leaving Philadelphia, going to New York, going to New Jersey, going to Long Island and Baltimore and these places, CC's and Harrisburg, you know, these are the things that I learned was like there's a bigger thing out there. And I wanted to be a tied to that. And I wanted to attach what we had in Philly to it. And um, so the thing to make your place is to find where you belong in the, in the you know thing like I said you know sometimes there's someone already doing shows so you ask like how can I help out you know my buddy Shane Merrill which we've had on the podcast who does a lot of shows in Chicago he's taking on John Ortiz who sings in sector hard fucking voice also congratulations to him he has another kid but that motherfucker you know he now does shows in Chicago and he has a huge piece of what the rumble is so you get with the program or you have to start your own program And then from there, like, understand that a lot of what goes on now is metric-based. You know, bands who start out small, depending on if they get in with the right crowd or their sound brings in a crowd, will determine specifically if there's a commercial viability enough or someone likes you enough to say, hey, let me try to book your band. Or, you know what, you guys need a manager. Or if a label has some interest. And then from there... You know, um, as a band starts to grow, to if they want to grow the band further, they've got to start playing shows as supporting a band that's bigger than them. But then at one minute, they've got to go ahead and start playing their own shows to prove that they can draw, which is where metrics come in. So now more than ever, the career-minded band starts way too soon for me, from my preference. Bands are so focused on... Immediately off the bat, well, we're gonna we want to be a full time band. Yeah, I, I fucking I get it, but at the same time, is do the fucking work, write good music, place shows, build an audience. Don't rely on the internet and the metrics that come from the internet, but build a fucking name for your band, and it'll be there. And some bands have the finances of their families to go ahead and allow them to just. You know, I'm just going to vacation for five years and just be a hardcore band. And then I love the amount of squares in their mid-30s to early 40s. that I've been a hardcore band, you know? And you hear the band, you're like, oh, they were ass. (laughs) Glad you got out, motherfucker. (laughs) Sorry, I'm a rotten son of a bitch sometimes. (laughs) But there's so many squares in music or in other industries that, like, will drop to me randomly. Hey, I used to be in this band. I'm like, "Uh, I don't even know the fucking band, you know? There's... If I had a dollar for every person ever was in the hardcore band, I probably wouldn't be pouring concrete for a living. I'd just live off that money. It's been thousands and thousands of hardcore bands. Few of them stick around. The key to having a band that sticks around is circumstances and all the right elements. Some of the bands had the great elements, terrible circumstances. Some of them had the best circumstances but didn't have the elements. And so why this affects a young promoter is that you have to be able to discern What league you're playing in. Yo, go out there and shoot your shot. No one's saying don't. But what I get from a lot of young promoters is that they say like, just fucked up. And you start like producing an attitude and an assessment of an opinion 
that isn't backed up in fact. You're just saying, hey, this band specifically didn't fuck with me, so they're not cool. Maybe it's, hey, man, they love to fuck with you, but they're working on something or they have a plan or they're being coached by somebody to do this, this, and this, and playing some young promoter shit isn't always the first thing on their thing. You know, if you're if you're doing it long enough, you're going to play into eventually being the promoter who does some of the bands who would one day grow to be a big band some of their first shows. And that's another hard thing, and it's something I've dealt with a long time is like, not just through the fest, but my own shows sometimes, you know, I'm there ground, ground zero doing the shows, doing the bands and management comes or booking agents change. And then a lot of what happens at booking, they call it history. Well, we've had history with Joe, but Joe's not the upper level. I ain't even the mid level. I'm just a dude that does shows, you know? And a lot of times I'm in a position where I have to understand that I am not able to stick with the band the way I'd like, you know, um, I, 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 I don't care. I don't get, I mean, it gets a little bummed out when it's like, oh yeah, I hooked up this band, you know, like, and now they fucking work with live nation. It is what it is. It's happened so much in the beginning. I used to get upset, but it just comes from wanting to not be the pro person. And this is also part of the fucking big machine that is commercialized corporate music is that these bands who want to get to a level will go ahead and sacrifice the denominator of being, well, we're a DIY band or we're, you know, we're, you know, we're an underground band because they want to get to the next level. And at this stage, every fucking band who has any salt in the game has had to work in those situations. So it's not, me saying, hey, if you work, I'm not Gilman Street. I'm not going to say, if you've got a barcode or if you work for this, we don't want to work with you. But it's the nature of the game where as bands get bigger, they have to work in a bigger premise. But the other side of this, every once in a while, they'll go, what's our old friend Joe up to? Hey, man, we haven't done shows in a while. You want to do something cool? And I'm always there because I love them and I want to support them still. And, and that's just a, another ebb and flow that comes from doing this thing. And... um even when within the festival there's ebbs and flows and I'm just lucky you know I'm lucky that because I found like worthwhile employment that keeps me motivated and like dude I can't tell you how much work I do just driving home um it's hard for me because I'm a cell phone guy still in a world of emails and dms and all this shit but I have managed to get the people that I need to work with to understand that that's how I roll I don't have time to send 10,000 emails even though I do send hundreds of emails in a week I need to call you we need to have this thing figured out in 10 minutes because I've got other shit I gotta do you know I got a full ass plate from fucking the time I leave my house which is anywhere between like 4 30 or 5 30 in the morning and there's times where I'm working until 5 30 at night and I'm coming home and I'm working on a show going to jiu-jitsu working on a podcast so I, I I implore anybody who is doing a thought process here, like, oh, I have some questions. Maybe if we get enough promoter-related questions, I'll do a whole episode on promoter questions. But the, the another thing I'd like to say is that what made my game stronger was respecting other promoters, building relationships with people down the street, down... Because I was a person who toured with dysphoria and then later would do tours with Punishment and Shattered Realm, I had relationships across the country with the promoters. So I was already in, in a, I was aware of their presence or they were aware of mine or we dealt with each other. So when I started really doing the fest, more than anything, it was easy to start talking to them. And, it, it, you know, I've, I said it before, when Rich Hall moved from New York, out west, that motherfucker's phone stopped ringing. But Rich Hall is who the fuck Rich Hall is. And that motherfucker has a lot of info. He still has good contacts. And I went to the OG. I said, hey, Rich, what's going on, man? Hey, do you know anything about, like, can you help me out with this band? And he's still my brother. You know, I love his, I love his son. I love his wife. You know, he still has a hand in this is hardcore. But, you know, you don't forget about the people who, you know, go on different paths. And you keep these connections because... The promoter is the ba- is the guy often, or the gal, sorry, there definitely is amazing girl promoters. Not as many, obviously, but there's definitely some ass kickers out there killing it, 
and um, I don't want to abscond their influence in, in this whole thing. Um, there is a thing about a promoter might book shows for four to eight years, sometimes ten at the most. And a lot of them bands broke up in that time. You know, sometimes, like I said, if it's the club or the scene changes or they want to move on or they lose too much money, they want to start a family, they don't have the time, or they, you know what, I'm going to become a manager, I'm going to become a booking agent. All these things are relative to why someone stops doing this job. And so, but those people have the contacts. I've gone to promoters, hey, I know you're from the town. Can you tell me who, can you give me a contact with this band? I know they're popping here. I'd like to get them my way. Or, hey, Gil, can you give me their contact? I really think they'd be great for this hardcore. And also, much love to all the local promoters who put their own fucking bands up and hit me up. Joe, this band from this town, they're fucking killing it. And it would be great to see a band from our area represented. Woo, I love hearing that. I love hearing that a promoter's thinking about the town, the city, putting that shit up on the fucking stage. And that fucking influences me heavily. You know, like, seeing the Raw Brigade dudes in Columbia flag stage diving for Youth of the Day at the reunion show in the church, at Union Transfer, not the church, is the reason why I would see them at the church years later. Now, because they played This Is Hardcore, and they eventually came to Philadelphia, and they start, you know, Carlos is here, a couple of the guys are here, and now that's a viable band that, you know, they just came to This Is Hardcore, and I was like, we gotta have these motherfuckers actually play this thing, to see these guys grow from that. Like, I wanna see hardcore represented in all areas, and I understand, I, I know what it means to be like, yo, you know, we've had bands from Moscow, we've had bands from, you know, all over this fucking, this, this world at this point. I'm always, I mean, things we say from Korea, shit. I mean, it's fucking great to think we've had so many international bands. You know, he's even had some Aussie bands. I love the support of the international community with This Is Hardcore, and I try my best to help with international bands. Specifically, I know in America, there's the small towns and small scenes that sometimes if their band is growing, it helps their shows get bigger. And I understand that. So when a band is starting to have some unknown, or we can maybe help them out. I always try to help them out in that way. Or even just give them a good Philly show if they're on the tour. And this is the networking you need. Not the ball washing. Not to make sure you are tweet and quote and say the right thing. And make sure you say the Knock Loose record's good. And make sure you give a full review if Vane's record comes out. Be your motherfucking self on social media. Make friends with people that you like. Check out the bands that you really are interested in. And just don't add to the chatter. Don't add to the fucking noise. You know, I mean, if you like the record, say you like the record, but no one's going to be sitting there. That fucking dude, Isaac, ain't sitting there with a fucking Excel sheet and be like, well, this promoter in Portland, Maine did not say that the new Knock Loose record's good. Can't fuck with them. It's not how it works. But people are kind of in this fucking 1984. If I don't say something, people might think that it's like, fuck that. Stop putting yourself under a magnifying glass and just be who the fuck you are. You know, also for young bands. I say it all the time. I'm going to say it every fucking show. Make your own fucking flyers. You know, make your own fucking flyers. If I put, I'm just going to use an example. If I put you with Sick of It All, I don't give a fuck if you're over top of Sick of It All. You're making a flyer and promoting the show. You do what the fuck you want. I love that shit. I love seeing bands make their own flyers for a show they're put on. I'm, I'm getting tired of bands not wanting to bring fucking gear. I'm going to start being a real dickhead and be like, oh, I have to bring gear? All right, it's going to be $25 a guitar cabinet, uh, $50 for drums. Like, I don't know when this, you motherfuckers don't have gear is, but get it the fucking gather. Feel like a parent having to dress you motherfuckers so you can go out and do your thing. There's a lot of stuff we'll talk about. If you give me some QA, I'll go ahead and we'll go through a gamut. I'll try to do an hour or so. I did some shit on the Patreon, but... I have the, no time for Patreon. I'm actually going to disable it. I just keep saying it, but I'm actually going to do it. I remember my login. Um, thank you for the people who sent money. That was cool. I think there's like 10 of you. If I ever make t-shirts, I'll send you some shit. But um, I now hear home myself on Patreon. Um, I just love doing this podcast. And 25 years of booking hardcore shows has given me a lifetime of memories, a lifetime of friendships. Everything that I look forward to in some way, is shaped or birthed in things that happen because of the hardcore scene. I'm indebted to the culture. I'm indebted to my personal hardcore scene and the worldwide hardcore scene. And I just love what the possibilities are that come from somebody taking a room, putting live music in it, 
and letting the kids who are going to see the show and the bands decide the outcome. It's such an electrifying experience to think that I could book four bands in four rooms in four days in a row and absolutely every show will be absolutely magnificently different. Even if I didn't change the room and I did four bands all four days in the same room, those shows would also be different. It is in the people who are in the room at the time. The band who decides to go off that night. The band who plays that extra song. The band who plays the cover. The kid who's like, I'm going to go up there and take that fucking mic. Or the kid who sees everyone standing around and is like, fuck this, I'm opening up the pit. If you're those kind of people, you're making your shit better. And if you're making your shit better, it means you're making my shit better. I live for you. I live to do shows. So the fucking soupy, this little dickhead who I would throw across the room if I was still champion of the mosh. I would fucking huck his ass 150 feet. Maybe I will again sometime. Lately, after I pulled my leg, I don't think so. Um, Literally, see this little asshole just open the show up, and then people are like, fuck yeah, it's on. I love the moment where a new band is playing, and their friends go off so they feel supported. You know, I love that. I've lived it for 25 years of my own shows. Been going to shows since I was fucking 12, turning 13 years old, man. Next year, I don't even like bragging, but next year probably will be, I think it's, yeah, I'll be fucking 30 years of going to shows. I'm only be fucking, I'll be 43 next year. This is my life. Why would I stop? What would engage me aside from prison or death? Nothing, you know? I mean, at a certain time, I, I'm kind of, your, your boy's getting scared. Not of death, but of the time where the everything has to be passed on to someone else because either my body can't keep up with getting up in the work going to work all day, coming home, having the time to book these shows. Or maybe I, I thank God for Bob, for Alex, for Soup, for these young guys who come in and they say, hey, Joe, you should check this out. Keeps me fresh. I'm not all, I'm not all knowing. And in fact, I try not to be a hater, but I see a lot of the same bands in from my teens and my 20s in the bands that are for the kids now in their teens and 20s. And sometimes it's hard for me to realize like, oh yeah, it's new for them, but it's not for me. But I love this. I I take this as an honest blessing to be able to continue to do this for as long as I have. I'm not going out anytime soon. I was joking forever that I I would do shows for 30 years. But I I don't know. I don't know when it's going to end. It won't be anytime soon. I got This Is Hardcore 2020. I got new bands that are fucking killing it. Me and Mike Mig are working on a new band. Hopefully we'll be ready for the Philly Hardcore Barbecue. I've got things I still want to do because the people like the Soups and the Alexes and the Jakes and the Hesitates and the Shackleds are fucking moving and they're moving still and I want to move with them. I don't want to be like the old guy sitting in the back. It gets me excited to be in the process, not just as Joe Hardcore, the promoter and the fest guy, the dickhead who was on gangland, but I want to get in the game here, not just kicking Soupy in the fucking chest, you know? And, and I get excited and reinvigorated, and that's why I never fucking stopped. There's always something I wanted to do. I always wanted to make sure that Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this fucking East Coast Hardcore would stay culturally the way it was because of Richie Crutch. While I was on fucking house arrest calling me once a week, I didn't fucking get completely detached. Because of Mike Barletti, Mike Hooligan, calling me and asked me to come out and tattooing me when I got done my, um, I was on house arrest and I had time to go and do the, like, (laughs) what do they call that, uh, community, uh, work. And then I had, I was allowed out for that time, so I would go get tattooed by Mike by having a big brother and a you know, best friend in him. We talk about Rome. We talk about history. We talk about Freemasonry. I, I felt attached to things, even though I wasn't allowed outside the house for almost a year. It was fucking the things I needed. And I came back, and if you look at that, this is hardcore. The year I got off house arrest, boom, 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 boom. That was the best one we did, and it sold out in the under fucking twenty four hours. But it was also the last one that we did at the Starlight. You know, in the last ten years of being at the Electric Factory. You know, I, I I didn't talk enough about mentors, but you know, Sean Agnew is the reason why we got into the Starlight Ballroom. Sean Martin, who was my 50-50 partner from 2006 to 2011. But at the when I moved on to 
the electric factory because shit was selling out and I'm getting all these texts. Fuck you. We hate you. You're a dickhead. How come I can't come to the show? Blah, 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 blah. Tim Moore, my big brother, he's been on the show. Hey, man, you really got to link with Brian. He can get you to the factory. Um, you know, <laughs> that's a life-changing moment for me. Life fucking changing fucking moment for me was going in and I, you know, I hung at Brian's bar, you know, Brian and Jason, I mean, did shows there the whole nine yards. So it wasn't really, oh, I don't know, Brian, uh, blah, 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 blah. No, that's not it at all. You know, I knew Brian, but we didn't work together and, and there ain't anything like working or seeing Brian work. And, um, Brian's been dead for a year now. And it's been one of the hardest times. Actually, no, I fucked up. He's been dead two years. God, fucking COVID. Brian and I talked Friday of um, March, like March 7th or something. And uh, he was talking about this is hardcore 2020 because COVID wasn't a thing yet. We didn't even know it was going to happen. Yeah, I talked to him Friday, March 6th. Just looked it up. And um, we were talking about headliners. He gave me some advice, as he always did. And I was going to Ohio to go sword fight. When I woke up Monday to go to Jiu-Jitsu with Hard Carl, Tim Moore called and told me Brian passed away. The last two years without Brian, you know, Brian's a staple, you know, I wish I had him on the podcast. I mean, he wasn't doing a podcast. I wish, you could, I wish you could hear his fucking story. But Brian is a DIY promoter who became a fucking giant in the industry and worked for all the corporate people, learned how to negotiate and deal in that world, but still be his own fucking man. When he passed, things changed in Philadelphia. And we all kind of felt rudderless for a bit. And um, I'm... I made a promise to him the last day of This Is Hardcore 2019. He's like, dude, I'm going to New York. I was kind of in a bad mood. There was things that I needed to change with the fest, and I was projecting instead of taking ownership. And um, he's like, just promise me you're coming back. Promise me we'll work on this. We'll get this together. You're coming back. You're not going to leave the fest. He's like, we, we still got work to do. You're not going to go somewhere else. I said, I promise you we'll do another one. And I'm keeping my fucking word. There will be a fest at the Electric Factory, which is now called Franklin Music Hall. We are working on two separate weekends. We have a headliner. If they happen, I'm going to literally go out and shoot fucking 100 rounds in the fucking air in excitement. Give you guys something to come home to. But having a mentor like Brian, like Tim Boer, like Sean Agnew, be able to call people like Andy Rice, be able to call people like Shane Merrill, be able to call my peers, people I looked up to, people that kicked ass. You know, even talking to Kevin Scadano in one of the first episodes of the podcast. You know, like, I still looked at things that people that, like, Tyler King did. I still obsessed over the uh, Olympic Coliseum shows. I'm still a student in the game, shit that happened 40 years ago. I fucking live and love this shit. I ain't fucking stopping anytime soon because the kids of today are supporting the things that I love. And to me, it still feels as real as it was when I booked my very first show 25 years ago. And I hope that that continues. I love you all for the support. I was going to do a show literally tonight to celebrate, but it didn't work out. So we will do a 25 years of Joe Hardcore shows like we did a 20 years of Joe Hardcore shows. But just thank you for the support. Thank you for the patience Thank you for the understanding. Thank you for understanding that I grew as a person and that the 16-year-old kid who did his first show is now a 41-year-old man who gives his life blessings to the fact that the hardcore scene gave me a place to be the person that I am today. And I love you all. This is HardcorePodcast.com. This is HardcoreFest.com. Philly HC shows, Instagram, Twitter. T-I-H-C on Instagram or on Twitter. This is Hardcore Fest on Instagram. The Joe Hardcore on Instagram. Make sure you're listening to the From Within podcast. Make sure you're listening to Post America podcast. Make sure you're listening to Broad Street Breakdown. All right? Support some fucking hardcore. Have some fun. Start a pit. Start a band. Do the right thing. Love you all.